Dr. Shaw, you've done a great deal of work in using machine learning to assess risk, make diagnosis, and evaluate treatment options. You recently published work in which you could predict the likelihood of death within six months to uh, assess the benefit of palliative care for those high-risk uh, patients. So on a higher level, could you tell us a little bit more about how this model works and what kind of data do you use to make these kinds of predictions? Uh, sure. So um, there's a couple of ways I can answer this one. The, the easy answer is that uh, it's a random forest in one case and in the other case a deep neural net. Mm -hmm. That is how the model works. Mm -hmm. uh, at the other level, I would say that, uh, or that is the model, and it uses prior two years of EHR data mm -hmm. to make the ascertainment about someone's mortality risk. But that, in some sense, is, uh, is not the best question to ask because what matters is the purpose. Mm -hmm. And like in medicine, we're typically interested in knowing how a model works. So we can decide, you know, one of two things. Well, can I trust it? Mm -hmm. And then that will guide me to the appropriate action that you should take. Like those are the two reasons we would want to know how something works. But in this case, <clears throat> the purpose of the model is to prioritize an already efficacious intervention. Mm -hmm. It is known, proven in RCTs that, random, uh, yeah, that uh, palliative care, when offered at the right time and advanced care planning services, improve quality of life mm -hmm. and patients have better outcomes, they live longer and they cost less. The problem is misallocation of resources. Mm -hmm. That the team offering those services is small mm -hmm. and uh, out of the 80 or 90 uh, people that get admitted any given uh, a day in our hospital, uh, about 10%, 20% might need these services, but typically palliative care gets called in too late. Mm -hmm. And the conversation happens too late in somebody's uh, uh, timeline to be useful. Mm -hmm. So what we're trying to do is time shift that conversation, mm -hmm. that instead of having it two days before somebody passes, have the conversation eight months, six months before, so you're fully awake, you're not in an emergency, and you can have a, a, a grounded conversation about what are your end, uh, end of life goals of care. Mm -hmm. And so the how part uh, actually is more important in, in that angle than mm -hmm. the exact mechanics of how the model works. Mm -hmm. So in a kind of typical use case in the, in, in the hospital setting where you have um, resource allocation constraints like that you've alluded to. You have teams that are you know rounding on many many patients. Mm -hmm. You um, I think you see this model as being most benefit beneficial in really triaging those patients that are at higher risk of mortality events in the near future. Correct so instead of triaging think of it the opposite of triage uh, as in who should the team talk to today. Mm -hmm. So one of the complaints that our, our palliative care team typically has is they get called in too late mm -hmm. to be effective. Mm -hmm. And you know, the treating doctors uh, wants to offer the best options that they can until they decide to mind switch and say, let's have that other conversation. Mm -hmm. But from a patient care perspective, that switch doesn't happen fast enough. Mm -hmm. And when you're already in the ICU, that's not the right time to have these conversations. Mm -hmm. So ideally, they would want to have these conversations when somebody is in an outpatient setting mm -hmm. or in a scheduled visit and not in an ED or in an inpatient setting. Mm -hmm. So while we run the model in an inpatient setting, mm -hmm. nothing is communicated to the patient. What happens is that given somebody's higher probability of death in the next three to 12 months, the palliative care team then has a conversation with their treating physician mm. to first understand like what is the real situation with this individual would they even benefit from having this conversation mm -hmm. and if the two doctors agree then the treating physician will initiate the conversation with the patient because they own that relationship mm -hmm. so yes the in the media it's typically spoken about as the mortality prediction model for palliative care but it's a little bit more nuanced than that mm -hmm. and the the whole point is that if I can only have eight conversations in a day, which are the eight conversations I should have? Right, right. 
Now, there are some feature sets, like vital signs, laboratory data, that you can kind of derive from EHR data mm -hmm. sets in making uh, prognosis predictions. But what I found to be, I think, most fascinating about, about your work is in um, the manufacturing of a lot of more relevant, potentially, mm -hmm. clinical features. So, for instance, one that I read about was in your analysis of, for instance, the number of specialists that a patient um, has seen in each quarter of the year mm -hmm. and really mapping that over time as, as kind of a derivative of change. Um, so, so how do you go about really generating hypotheses around you know, even what feature sets could be most interesting that you could even track or think about tracking for predicting health outcomes? That's a great question. Um, there's two broad ways to go about this. Uh, one school of thought is to say, you know, I'm going to give the input data, I'm going to give the outcome that I intend to either predict or sometimes a classification task, and I will let the computer figure it out, mm -hmm. which is sort of the usual approach that is taken in deep learning settings, and you learn the right representation mm -hmm. of all of the messy data that you have. Mm -hmm. So we've tried that. Mm -hmm. It does help, a little bit higher performance. Mm -hmm. uh, very difficult to explain those features. Like mm -hmm. you couldn't have from that, you know, describe this rate of change of number of specialist visits. Mm -hmm. So on the other hand is the uh, domain expertise driven feature engineering. Mm -hmm. And there what we have found is counts of things, mm -hmm. the rate of change of things, mm -hmm. and the change in the rate of change of things. Mm -hmm. Those three things. So the number of specialist visits, the number of drugs, the number of encounters that you might have with anybody in the healthcare system, mm -hmm. the number of comorbidities on your problem list, and the rates of change of all of these. Mm. Like in general, if somebody gets sicker, your interactions with the healthcare system increase. Mm -hmm. And that's the intuition of the signal we're trying to pick up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But to answer your question, generally speaking, counts, rates of change, and the change in the rate of change mm -hmm. are good, uh, good things to pick up. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and thinking about kind of sensitivities, you've looked at over 2 million uh, DI de-identified uh, patient records to examine two overall populations in the hospital. Both groups very ill, mm -hmm. very sick patients, but one could actually benefit mm -hmm. from interve intervention X mm -hmm. and one actually would not benefit or even be exposed to harm for any further intervention, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so in a learning method that involves kind of human care providers to supervise this pattern recognition, um, what technical challenges do you think really remain in evolving from a current supervised system and model to a more of a scalable unsupervised mm -hmm. system? Mm -hmm. That's a tough one. Um, currently, in, in this particular problem, um, given that the model we built is about uh, mortality, and then we're assuming that someone who's likely to die is likely to benefit. The first thing we actually did was to run the model in silent mode, as in the model makes a prediction. We don't show it to anybody. Mm -hmm. And prospectively, we have a nurse and a physician reviewing people's charts, ascertaining would this person benefit or would this person not benefit. Mm -hmm. And then we look at concordance, as in if we identified likely to benefit based on the prediction, versus we identify likely to benefit based on the clinician and the nurse, mm -hmm. how good is the agreement? Mm -hmm. We just finished that study uh, on about 295 patients. Mm -hmm. The agreement is spectacular. Mm -hmm. So that's half of an answer. Mm -hmm. In the long run, I think what you're getting at is once you put the systems in play, mm -hmm. they will change the way care is delivered. Mm -hmm. And so on a routine basis, we would have to keep retraining the model mm -hmm. and re-asking this question uh, in the form of, are our predictions still a good surrogate for the task at hand? Mm -hmm. And there's a couple of ways to do this. Uh, one, you could just monitor the calibration of the prediction you make and the actual event that happens. Mm -hmm. uh, the other ways to do it is to say randomly sample a few cases every few months and see whether your assumptions are still valid. And there could be other ways uh, to do that. But mm -hmm. that's a great point that you bring up. Mm -hmm. Great. 
So you studied, so we talked about how the, the study involving many millions of, of kind of de-identified de patient records, which in context of, of 300 million patients, so to speak, in the U.S., is still a drop in the bucket, mm -hmm. right? Um, so with regards to kind of open data sharing initiatives, um, as it currently stands, our de-identified health data is being bought and sold by um, corporate and commercial organizations really on a daily basis mm -hmm. um, in, in fairly streamlined and legal ways as it stands. Um, so do you believe in a future whereby patients themselves may have a right and arguably a moral duty uh, to share and potentially sell um, their own health data for the purpose of larger kind of research initiatives? Mm -hmm. That's another great question. So I think in the morning we're talking uh, after Jeff Dean's talk that everybody wants to benefit from the collective learning from lots of patients of data. Mm -hmm. But as, uh, as a country, we don't trust our, our companies, we don't trust our government, mm -hmm. and we don't trust our providers or health insurers with our medical data. Mm -hmm. So something has to give. Mm -hmm. uh, there's two thoughts that I've had about this. One is this notion of data as a public good. Mm. That if I want to benefit from the experiences of similar patients, mm -hmm. uh, it is my moral duty to contribute my data to the collective learning. Mm -hmm. The other is this notion of donating data. Mm. People donate blood all the time. We donate organs. There's a lot of things that are more precious than data that we freely give away, mm. willingly. Mm -hmm. And data are something that can be donated over and over again. Mm -hmm. You give a kidney, you can only give it once. Whereas data, you can keep donating. Mm -hmm. And what I would hope is that as a country, we go towards some sort of data sharing, either as a public good or as a donation, rather than down the road of selling data. Mm -hmm. I think if healthcare data, the predominant mechanism of exchange turns out to be selling and buying data, mm. we, we might actually not realize all of the benefits that we can from data analysis. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. So switching gears now to thinking about um, more of a therapeutics perspective, um, at what point in the drug development cycle do you believe insights from um, such aggregated real-world data sets um, can provide really the greatest impact? There's many uh, points at which data can inform uh, both the therapeutic development as well as its deployment or use. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not that familiar with the development side, but you know, at the minimum, uh, figuring out are we recruiting the right kinds of patients. Like one of the talks this afternoon was that uh, the number of people uh, who are eligible for uh, asthma trials is 4% or 6% was the answer at that point. And so can we design trials that mirror the real population mm. that, will, that we anticipate using these drugs or interventions and therapeutics? And so that's on the, on the, on the creation side. Understand there's restrictions around uh, you know uh, regulatory approvals and to figure and to demonstrate that the intervention actually works. So it's a different kind of a trial. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute funds these kinds of trials that actually study populations in their native setting. Mm -hmm. And then on the uh, deployment of therapeutic side, data can be immensely valuable. So particularly for uh, expensive interventions uh, and for rare conditions the use of analytics can identify the people who were missing. Mm. So I'll give an example from joint work with Joshua Nolis and the FH Foundation, where there's a condition, familial hypercholesterolemia, that is uh, uh, prevalent about one in 250 in the general population, but one in 90 or one in 100 in a lipid clinic. Mm. So in order to find that one case, I would have to sequence 100 people. It's too much. But given the people we've already diagnosed, we can train a classifier, mm -hmm. similar to a spam filter, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Now a new patient walks in, you run this classifier, it flags somebody as a potential, and the classifier is right seven out of 10 times. So now you reduce the testing burden mm -hmm. from 100 to 10 mm -hmm. to find seven cases. Right. And then the economics and the logistics become viable enough that you can actually treat these individuals. Mm -hmm. And if you actually treat seven people with PCSK9 inhibitor drugs for you know, five, six years, you'll actually prevent a couple of heart attacks mm -hmm. shown in RCTs. Mm -hmm. So that's how data can help 
pinpoint mm -hmm. the person most likely to benefit mm -hmm. and quote unquote enrich the population so that your interventions have a higher chance of being effective mm. instead of just giving them out on everybody. Right, okay. And when we look at biases in risk stratification methods widely used today, so for instance, the ASCVD uh, mm -hmm. uh, risk score for predicting uh, and managing kind of heart attack uh, risk based on the Framingham Heart Study, um, is widely appreciated in the medical community as being um, you know, biased towards African American population and Asian American populations, um, which can in some sense be corrected for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but when we think about developing learning models based on patterns that may be unclear mm -hmm. um, to us as humans, um, how do you think about in the future addressing kind of other, other subliminal biases that could arise from using subjective and unstructured uh, provider-generated clinical uh, data at scale? Mm -hmm. So another great question. So fairness in machine learning is a huge topic. Mm -hmm. There are a few broad categories of approaches people are taking. One is if you know upfront what your sensitive attribute is, you know, gender, age, ethnicity, you can essentially tell the model while it's being built to be blinded to those attributes mm -hmm. and perform agnostic of those. It has its pros and cons, mm -hmm. because if that happens to be the most informative attribute, ignoring that doesn't sound right, mm -hmm. uh, but that is one way to handle it. Mm -hmm. The other way to handle it is to ensure what's called group level fairness, mm -hmm. which is to say that you want the model to be equally correct in every subgroup you can define based on this uh, uh, feature. Mm -hmm. So if you do gender, there's two subgroups. If you do ethnicity, there might be multiple subgroups. And you want to make sure that in each subgroup, your positive predictive value is the same. Mm -hmm. So that's called group fairness. Uh, also referred to uh, often as equality of odds and a few other criteria. Mm -hmm. And then there's the most stringent version, which is what is called individual fairness. Mm -hmm. And the idea there being, you want a model such that if it makes a prediction about me and I'm a man, uh, I would not have any regret if I was a woman and the same model was used on me. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to do uh, right. computationally, mm -hmm. but that is where the research uh, folks are headed. So it's definitely on the radar. Uh, on a practical level, I think institutions have to acknowledge the fact that these models are not infallible. They will make mistakes and they could be biased mm -hmm. and put in place the necessary monitoring systems that every night or every month you have a dashboard saying, oh, my model is going out of calibration. It's making mistakes for this ethnic group so you can retrain. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you so much for all of your work in helping to organize this wonderful conference and for taking the time to speak with us about your research and the field at Broad. Oh, thank you for making them. Great questions. Thank you. Right.